Let's rock and roll. Okay, so once again, welcome and thank you for joining. This is now our sixth installment of the year long series of meetups that's focused around the nature of science component of Ohio's learning standards for science. Uh, so as most of you know already, each month we're focusing on one aspect of the scientific and engineering practices. And then our final one will be just category from the nature of science chart itself. Um, if you're not familiar already, you can find the nature of science chart on pages eight through 12 in the front matter of the standards or it also the applicable part of it is at the beginning of each course and grade level. So most of you already know us, but I'm Lydia Hunter and my colleagues, Kathy Holmes and Robin Deems, uh, we make up the science team at the Department of Education um, in the Office of Learning and Instructional Strategies. And I wanna just say that we always welcome any of you to reach out to us if you have questions, if you have suggestions for us, if you need help finding resources or just anything else. So here are our emails. So um, just to remind you why we even developed this whole nature of science part of our standards, um, incorporating the nature of science, the doing side of science, allows students to engage um, themselves in the process. It showcases the norms by which scientists study the world and communicate to others about their work. This makes students' knowledge more meaningful and it embeds that knowledge more deeply into each child's worldview. This also helps children recognize the work of scientists and engineers as a creative endeavor and one that has deeply affected the world that we live in. So we're going to start today um, reviewing some of these practices um, with a quick example. And then later in the hour, we're going to get, do some breakout sessions and dive a little more deeply into today's practice, which is at, um, about constructing explanations. But first, let's review some of the other practices using this example. So I found this graph out there on the internet. And as you can see, it has to do with COVID-19 daily deaths starting, you know, back in the spring sometime early in the pandemic and going up through close to now. So the first kind of thing that we often ask students to do is make observations and develop some questions from them. So let's start by just making some observations of this particular graph. So um, there aren't too many of us here today. If you want to just unmute yourself and make an observation, that's fine. If you want to throw it in the chat, that's also completely fine. And Robin, I can't really see the chat while I'm sharing. So if you want to, you know, call out some things that people might have noticed about this particular graph. It's weird how the winter months or the colder months, the deaths are way more than the summer months. Okay. More deaths seem to be in the winter months. What else? And then yet and still you would think that um, you would have more in the warmer months because people are, are out so it could spread because you have, you know, chances for people to mingle and you know that interaction where if it's cold people are at home so you're not together but it's really the opposite okay anything else that anyone notices about this the data um july 4th it looks like right around july 4th there was a spike in in death okay I can't maybe more it. maybe more people getting together that caused the spread. Is that June twenty eighth? Is that that really big peak? That oh. single peak there? Um, no, I think June twenty eighth is the little dot right after it that's way down low again. Okay, yeah. then 
I guess I take back the July 4th. I was just assuming it was the. Yeah. The, so the, in a minute, I'm going to, Robin's going to actually drop the link to this in the chat and we can look at it in person and you can play around with it. Um, but let's just um, move on to what questions do you have about this graph or the trends on here? Like, what would you like to know more about? I'm just curious to see what does that, that spike around that June 28th, what is the significance of that spike? Because it really stands out among everything else. It has to have some type of significance. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. When I looked at this, I noticed all this up, down, up, down, up, down each day. And I was really curious, like, why are there suddenly a lot of deaths one day and then not very many the next day? So that was a question I kind of had. Yeah. What else? Yeah, oh, Jenny was saying she wondered why it went down in the spring and then back up again. Okay. So with students, we might do something just like this, right? We might look at some information. It might be a primary source. It might be a photograph. It might be a data set like this one is. And we might just ask them, you know, what observations do you have? What inferences do you maybe make that somebody mentioned, you know, that maybe it was after July 4th that something went up or whatnot. And then what, what do you wonder about? And so that could lead us then into an ex, uh, doing some kind of an investigation or finding more information. So sometimes we sort of think of the next step as being uh, collecting data. But in this particular case, um, some of the data has already been collected for us and is stuck on this graph already. So let's jump into a little bit deeper dive in analyzing and interpreting it and see if we can get any answers to our questions. So Robin, are you putting the link to that in the chat? In the chat, yeah, you the link find the a, an actual link to this graph and you can slide the, your um, cursor along and look at the numbers in a little bit more detail. Is anybody having any trouble getting to it? So I'll just give you a minute to play around with it a little bit. So that great big blip that we saw, you know, we, we realized that that was not from July 4th. That actually came on the 25th of June. So what might have made that blip? Yeah, so I think that's a good question um, to go with. So what possible explanation do you guys have for that's a really odd day. It, it's not around any holiday. I mean, besides that being the first day of summer, I mean, it's already nice out, so. Well, and I guess a question I have is, does someone die like immediately after they get COVID? Or is that a lag? And I'm also curious about that up and down that I saw all the time. Like, do we have more people dying every other day <laughs> or every couple or three days? What, what could explain all this up and down? Because I really don't think that more people die, you know, a lot on Monday and then 
none on not so many on Tuesday and then a lot more again on Wednesday. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Does anybody have any thoughts on why we have all these little individual peaks, like especially the June 25th one? Actually, I think that lower, that the lower point, that is the seven day average. So it's giving you the daily total and then the seven day average. Because if you look at the, if we go back to the 25th, it's like deaths were 2466, but yet the seven day average was only 847. So that would account for that big differentiation. And same thing as we go on into the winter months, we're seeing a much bigger spike in between. So it's actually giving us extra pieces of, it's giving us two pieces of data for each day instead of just one thing. Okay, and um, at this point, of course, we're trying to construct a little bit of an explanation or an answer to a question or something like that, but we maybe don't, don't know everything that we need to know about this graph. And so Robin has just um, kind of added to our understanding of the graph. Another thing that I would want to know is, you know, is, are these deaths that were reported on each one of these days? Or are these the days that people actually died? Because, you know, it might be that on Sunday or something like that, the hospital might not be submitting data somewhere. So there's just a lot more questions that might have to happen from here. And I don't really have an answer to anything about this graph. But um, the point isn't really to answer this, but to talk about the process of developing explanations. So we were starting to construct some explanations, but we haven't really investigated the situation thoroughly. And we don't really have enough evidence to support a claim at this point, right? So we would cycle back to asking some of those other questions that we were just talking about, like, are some of these points the uh, weekly average? Um, are when were the deaths reported? Whatever it might be, and you know, just get some more information to kind of inform our explanation. So these practices, I want to point out, are not used just in a linear fashion. So it's not. Whoops. It's not just a, a path that we follow, kind of like a scientific method or something, where we start with asking questions and go straight in order through these practices. Rather, each one of them can be important at many different stages in the learning cycle. So don't think of them as just linear steps, but instead more of like a tool chest of skills that students develop um, so that they can approach different science and engineering tasks effectively. So scientifically literate citizens are not only able to use each one of these skills well, but they also need to recognize where and which one is the appropriate skill to use. So a really important part of our job as science teachers is to hone a deepening understanding of these processes as the students progress through the K-12 continuum. So we really want to um, give them as many tools in their tool chest as we can, so to speak. So you will notice that they progress um, from the you know, introductory level through the more complex levels as we go from kindergarten through 12th grade. And I think I'm gonna turn this maybe back over to Robin, unless anyone has any closing questions or comments about that little activity and introduction. And Robin is gonna walk us through a little bit deep, deeper dive into constructing explanations. So I'll stop sharing, Robin, so you can do whatever you would like. Okay, thanks, Lydia. 
So we're going to walk through this experience using um, some data that was collected dealing with lionfish. So, and this is, um, and I'll share you all with you all of the stuff at the end. Um, first, I wanted to give you the link to the Google folder. It should be showing up in the chat now. So you want to go ahead and make sure you can access that. And we're going to break you guys up into two rooms um, in just a little bit to kind of work through a couple of different case studies. But we have some introductory information that we want to share with you first. So let me go ahead and make sure I'm sharing sound. And all right. So um, Kathy and Lydia, I can't see the chat at this moment. So if for some reason the video doesn't work when I start playing it, you'll just have to shout out and let me know. Lionfish are a beautiful tropical coral reef fish that are found in a wide area of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The reason that people are concerned about them is that lionfish are now what we call an invasive species. They're now found in a part of the world's oceans where they don't belong. And so what has happened is over the last few years, probably through the release of aquarium lionfish that were brought into the United States, they have formed a population in the Atlantic Ocean and begin to spread rapidly. We know they have very few predators of their own in the Atlantic region. Sharks and other predatory fish just don't seem to be consuming lionfish and controlling their populations. Some of the research that we've done in the Bahamas where we've observed populations of native species that lionfish consume have shown that lionfish can reduce the biomass of their prey by 95% in just a two year period. What we're seeing is that reefs actually look very different after lionfish numbers have increased rapidly on them to the point where we're seeing some species simply are not being found on these sites anymore. So monitoring lionfish populations is incredibly important so that we understand where the invasion has taken hold, how many lionfish there are, and what kinds of habitats they're affecting. And so by understanding the numbers of lionfish that we have in the invaded Atlantic region, we can understand and estimate what their impact on native species is likely to be, and then also understand how much we might need to reduce the population of lionfish in order to start preventing those impacts from happening and protect our native coral reefs in the Atlantic region. Okay, so that gave you a brief introduction as to what is has been going on with lionfish over the years and um, so researchers started trying to figure out okay these numbers of lionfish seem to be just crazy out of control and knowing that they can cause so much devastation in the areas where they're found they were trying to figure out all right what what really is going on and what can we do to kind of slow them down so that they're not, you know, because the poor reefs, they've had so many other traumas going on with all the bleaching events and things like that. And this was just one more thing that was going on. So um, they started doing some research into trying to figure out what the numbers were. Um, and so I'm going to share with you kind of how they go about doing the um, doing the sampling and trying to get the data that uh, that they need. So let me scroll down and hit this one. All right. Let me share my screen again. Some of the challenges that come specifically with monitoring lionfish are that they now have a range in the Atlantic and Caribbean that is over 4 million square kilometers. We're finding lionfish from very shallow waters in estuaries and mangroves all the way to over a thousand feet deep where a commercial submarine are seeing lionfish on the bottom. It's a huge range, so instead of censusing every single lionfish in the population, 
What we are able to do is instead sample the population using a variety of underwater ways of doing measurement. Some of the methods that we use to estimate populations of lionfish are what we call underwater visual surveys. This involves a scientist or a volunteer or a citizen scientist using scuba diving to go underwater and count fish along a certain area of the reef tract. We call this kind of survey a transect, and what we do in the survey is we would count all of the lionfish that we see within a certain area along a, essentially a giant measuring tape that stretched underwater. And by understanding the area that we've searched and the number of lionfish that we've seen in that area, we can calculate the density of lionfish. By doing that same survey over a large number of different sites, we can begin to build a picture of what the average density is of lionfish in a certain amount of habitat, and then scale up that estimate to a broader regional level to understand what the population size might be. Sometimes we don't always have the ability to do these underwater transect surveys. And if we want to cover a really broad area of the lionfish population, we might have to use a different method. And that's where an underwater roving survey can come in handy. What happens with this technique is that uh, scuba divers will go underwater, and instead of using a large measuring tape to look at the area that they've surveyed, they will time how long they're searching for lionfish. And they will then count the number of lionfish that they've seen in a certain number of minutes on their swim. The Volunteer Fish Survey Project uses citizen science volunteers who are scuba dive trained and travel all over the world to do recreational dives, often when they're on holiday. Even if you don't plan to become a marine biologist, you can still contribute to marine research through gathering data, even while you're on holiday or doing something on the side. Okay, so that told us a little bit about how they went about gathering the data that they needed. And um, I thought this was particularly interesting because they know that they don't have enough bandwidth to do all the research themselves. So they were employing folks who were on vacation out enjoying the reef. And it's like, oh, hey, while you're out here, you know, can you do this for us? So incorporating those citizen science opportunities, I think are amazing and also, you know, really help to advance the work so much further than trying to make the researchers do it all on their own. So what they noticed, get rid of that page. Um, what they noticed was that the numbers of lionfish were growing exponentially. And I'll try to pull up a graph here for you um, so that you can see how it's changed. Let me share my screen again. So this shows us from 2004 to 2014. Um, the different numbers. And so you, you're looking at a really steep curve. And if I were to click on the, each of these units, it's going to show me kind of what the, the slope is. And so the steeper the slope, we know that means the, the faster, the greater the, the rate of growth is. But something starts to happen right around, you know, year um, 20, between 2008, 2010, that the numbers you know drastically start to to decrease the rate at which they are um, reproducing so what we're gonna do is work in a couple of groups to see if maybe we can help come up with a possible explanation so um, i'm gonna put you guys into two different um, groups two different breakout groups but if you go into the Google folder, you will see um, a, a, a document for group one and a document for group two. And you'll be given a case study that they did looking at some of the different types of non-density dependent factors that could have contributed to this. So you're going to be looking at um, organisms other than the lionfish 
but kind of learning from some of the studies that they've done on these other species and see if we can apply any of that to what we know about lionfish. So um, can everybody access the Google folder? If you cannot, raise your hand, either physically if you've got your camera on or put the raise your hand um, feature or somehow let me know because I don't wanna throw you into a breakout room until you can actually access the information. So um, when you get into the folder, you will see um, breakout room one and breakout room two. And there's even a breakout room three if we had so many that we needed to do a third. Um, and on your document, when you get in there, it'll give you some information about what they studied. It will, uh, most of them have some type of graph in there, but then it will also have a couple of questions for your group to answer. So we're gonna have each group kind of read through their information and answer their questions. I'll give you guys about mm, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll bring you back and we'll have each group share with the other group what they had learned about, because you won't, both groups won't be seeing the same data and the same information. So we'll bring you back and have you share, um, and then we'll kind of work through this together. All right, any questions before I hop in? Lydia, you're muted. Were you talking to me? Okay, I, I found it. I needed to post that drive folder again because a couple of people just joined us, so they probably couldn't get to it. But okay. I, I went back and found it. <laughs> okay. So has everybody got the folder then? All righty, so I'm going to go ahead and set up our breakouts. And again, I'll give you guys about 20 minutes, or sorry, 10 minutes, two rooms. It'll assign you automatically. So it's just going to go ahead and sort everybody. Um, Lydia and Kathy, it may end up throwing you in a room too, just to, to warn you. Um, they've changed the breakout room thing. It doesn't tell me how much time now. So we'll see. I guess we'll be in there. I'll try to pull you back in 10 minutes then. Oh, there's the option. There we go. Ten minutes. All right. Here we go. We'll see you back in about ten. So welcome back, everybody. So um, because we had two groups, uh, group one, you would have been doing um, case study one. And if you noticed the document that I sent you to to read through the case studies, you'll see that all four of them are on there. So even though, or actually five of them total. Um, so even though you didn't get to actually look at that case study in your group today, you'll still have access to that information if you want to look at it later. So we're going to give just a couple of minutes for each group to kind of share out what they talked about um, with relation to their case study. And then we'll see if we can make some determinations about what might be going on with the lionfish. Um, Lee, since you just joined us, I put a link to the Google folder in the chat so you can access some of the different documents that folks are referencing in this section. All right, so who from group one would like to share about their case study? So our, ours was about the planting of the uh, peppers. Okay. And basically from looking at the graph, which we were like, what the heck is this graph? But <laughs> basically we noticed that there was a, uh, like a sweet spot and the, the higher the density, the, the, the lower the yield and that there was definitely no more, uh, like you weren't getting any value out of all that extra planting basically is what we discovered in our few minutes of kids coming in and dogs and all that other kind of stuff. 
<laughs> but but in a nutshell, uh, that's what we did. And I don't know how much more you want me to go on this, you know, for time or whatever. But um, because oh, there, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. no, I was saying, was there something specific that kind of limited the growth of those plants? I'm thinking something specific, or I was yeah. just thinking about. Go ahead. No, was there was there competition? Were there was there disease on them? I mean, did it? Was there any of that going on? So initially, I'm going to say competition, but I was going back to the readings before I could give like a, a good answer. So I feel like a, a underprepared student right now, where I'm oh, like, wait, exactly where right. am I missing? <laughs> I know I'm with you too. I'm I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah, but you my. Know, Go ahead. And your students are going to be there too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you had all of 10 minutes to look through this, right? We can't solve all the world's problems in 10 minutes. <laughs> Even though they can do it on, you know, on Scorpion, right? But um, so that's okay that, that you know, you're there. And, and if I had given you more time, some of it might have risen to the top. But um, any, Crystal, was there anything that you noticed um, that uh, Ebony hasn't shared yet? No, I mean, that's pretty much what we talked about. We did think about the competition and, you know, with everything being so dense that they'd have to compete for light and, um, mm -hmm. you know, water and things like that. So that's what we were assuming is why, you know, the growth, it didn't yield as much. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Group two. Don't everybody speak at once. We didn't really talk about it at all. So, um, but the first question is how does the realize differ between populations that start small and those that start big? So it seems to me like on the one that says high resource, when it started big, it decreased as the population got bigger. And then with the low resource one, um, as the population, as the density got larger, the per capita got smaller too. So for both of them, as the density increased, the per capita growth also decreased. Right, okay. All right, so if we go through, let me pull this up real quick. And you will see, um, when I give you the link to all of this, you'll have all the teacher notes and everything that'll, um, actually give you some of the right answers if you choose that you wanna use this with some of your students. Um, but if we look at, let me go ahead and pull up so many pages. All right, if we pull up the case studies. So if you were to, um, and I, I, I group one, you already did this. So these are, are four of the most common um, mechanisms that you can uh, limit your, your um, population growth. And so we mentioned at the, for the paprika peppers that it seemed like, you know, when they were, when they were first starting out, there were so many of them that were packed in together that they were really having to fight over, you know, with each other to get those different nutrients that they needed, the sunlight, the water, things like that. So of the four things that are listed up here, interspecific competition, interspecific predation, disease and parasites, and social behavior, which of those four do we think were kind of at play with the pepper plants? Competition. Competition, okay. So for the um, group two, you guys had the, the protozoans. So at higher densities, they have a lower population growth rate, especially when less food is available. And that's kind of what you said. So which of those four would make us think that the protozoan we're dealing with? Would that be the same one? It would be the same one. Very good. Now, there are two studies 
or three studies that we didn't look at. This fourth one was talking about blue crabs and it went through a similar situation where they had taken um, groups of blue crabs and they started realizing that um, at certain points they were having predation on the larger from of the larger crabs on the smaller crabs um, and so they did some research to see did it have to do with you know quantities was it because they were crowded was it because there was no food availability um, and what they found there though was that it was more a social um, behavior as opposed to anything like there was other food available. So they didn't need to be eating their brothers, sisters, cousins, whatever. Um, but that it was more of a, um, from a competition standpoint, that if I eat you now, I don't have to compete against you at, to find a mate later, right? Um, so there was a little bit of that going on as well. Um, and then the, the fish, the other two, one of them talked about um, parasites and the, mosquito larvae was also talking of a little more density um, issues, but it was looking at predation within the species as well. But if we look at the end result from, make sure I'm pulling up the right one here. From the lionfish, what they notice happening is that as they get a little bit bigger and the populations grow to a certain point that there are a couple different things that are at play. They started noticing that they did have um, a carrying capacity that was slightly less than what they expected there to be, but they also noticed that there was a little bit of interspecific competition going on, as well as changes in the cannibalism. So this activity that we've just run you through, let me go back to the beginning for you. This just recently came out from HHMI, so Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And um, all of the information that's in our, um, Google folder is replicated from what's here. They actually also, I found after I had already created ours, then I realized, oh, hey, there's actually a Google folder that they have access to. So it has some of the different information. But um, for those of you that are teaching high school biology specifically, um, this would be a, a great resource to use in your classroom. And it does, it does get in a lot deeper to, um, when they're calculating population um, and what all goes into that process. So we you know, kind of cut some of that out because we knew we wouldn't have time to make everyone do the math. Um, so we kind of gave you different pieces, but you have access to all of that to use as well. All right. Um, so as you're constructing your explanations with your students, let me go ahead and I'll stop sharing, but I will go ahead and put the link in here. As you're constructing this with your students, they're not necessarily going to have the perfect ending explanation as they go through the process. And it's a good idea. Start out getting their, their ideas on what happens early and then have them refine that. And kind of like we've talked about in other sessions, if the students are um, continually refining their explanation and their definitions and making different models, then they see their whole learning process as, as not a, you know, you're wrong and then you're right. It's, it's constantly, the more we learn, the better we get, the closer we get to the target. Um, let's see, Lisa, would this work with seventh grade? Um, I think some of the population calculations, depending on where your students are in their math skills, um, you, could, you could definitely try it, but be prepared for um, a little bit of anxiety on their part if they, if they don't have the math skills. But I think it's definitely something to look at. Um, and the other reason I, I really like this activity is because it does talk about the importance of 
having um, citizen science in this process uh, and how they, they used it. And even at the, um, on that very last page where it was kind of talking about the lionfish, I mean, they're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. They're pretty sure um, that it has to do with that, that competition and that maybe the, um, the carrying capacity wasn't as great as what they, they were expecting but they're still gathering that data. And they actually, um, they refer to a couple of different groups that are out there that have um, derbies for lionfish where they're actually, people are going out and trying to kill them because they are difficult to kill. They are, you know, they are venomous. And um, so you've gotta be really careful, but they'll send out groups just like we have the walleye derbies um, up on Lake Erie and <laughs> they'll have them for lionfish. And they do demos as to you know how to cook lionfish so that they're not just killing them; we're actually using them um, for people to eat. Uh, but it definitely you know encourages people to be part of that. Um, and it also talks about other opportunities that you might have in your own area to get involved in citizen science. So it's you know a lot of our students may never see a lionfish; they're not going to get the opportunity to go to a coral reef, but we have invasive species here in Ohio as well. And so there are ways that our students could get involved, whether it's the research component um, of learning about the invasive species and trying to figure out what the solution is to actually being part of implementing that solution, whether you're going on a garlic mustard pull in a local park um, or something like that. So I really, that's what I really um, appreciate about this activity. Um, are there any other questions that folks have about this particular activity? And again, we ran you through it really quickly, um, but any other questions or things that just aren't, uh, aren't gelling for you? I, I have, a, oh, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. You go. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had a question about uh, the additional resources. So in, in 10 minutes, we were able to kind of quickly look it over and say, oh, are we going to guess competition? So if you layer in additional resources for this, will they be able to uncover the, uh, like the evidence for their findings? Um, yeah, I think they can. Okay. I think they can. Yeah, there's, there's a, a good bit more in there that we didn't share with you. Um, and there are even each of the, um, the case studies, actually, if you've got high school students and you think they could read the actual article that was written about these studies, it has links to those articles. So they can get the nitty gritty of what actually happened. Um, and that's also a, a good opportunity for them to get a, a chance to read good scientific material as well. Now, I would not recommend that at seventh grade, but for high school, yeah, I think they definitely could do it. The nice thing about the HM, HHMI is that they kind of cleaned up the data so it's a little bit digestible for high school students, but they also provide you the link as, as Robin mentioned to the actual data so they can get a deep dive into that too, not just the articles, but even going a little deeper into looking at the various types of information that they pulled up. So there's there's a lot of resources there, depending upon your level of student, you know, you can, you can start at the surface and then you can go as deep as you like. And I was just going to say, to reiterate again, if you have a biology colleague or if you teach biology, the logistic growth model um, equation and so forth, it's pretty well explained in there. So I think it's something that would make a lot of sense with a piece of biology that sometimes teachers tell us that they or their students struggle a bit with. So you might recommend that to your biology colleagues if that is not you. It's a really nice resource. Yeah. And I also, I also think it's good because where they're linking it to the science, then your students are going to see the relevance in it, right? We're just not making up something in class to teach them a concept. You're seeing in practice, this is, you know, this is really happening in the world and this is what's being done about it. So the students get a chance to actually experience real relevant science. So. All right. Um, so we put the PowerPoint back up. So let's kind of wrap this up and look at, you know, what do we do as teachers? How do we make, bring all of the parts and pieces that we've brought to you together for your students in the classroom? 
So in the role of teacher, you're going to be providing phenomena and events that allow students to take that deep dive to construct explanations using models and various representations that are based on evidence. That evidence can be obtained from valid and reliable resources, such as their own experiments, as well as research from other entities, government entities, um, other universities, as we brought things to you from citizen science, you get an opportunity to pull a lot of different resources together. Want students to work together collaboratively. We didn't send you together, you know, we didn't send you off individually, but you got an opportunity to, to discuss and work through what the problem was ahead of us, digesting what that information gave you and how to make sense of that, and then to tie it into the even bigger role of, you know, this is a certain population, but how can we take those summaries that we came up with here and carry it over into the lionfish? So this gives students the opportunity to work together, to apply their scientific ideas, principles, to, and evidence to construct, revise, or use an explanation for things that are happening in real life. They should test their conclusions and revise explanations as needed. As we brought more information to the table, it kind of widened the possibilities, gave us an opportunity to explore in different realms and see what still makes sense in light of the evidence on the table and what we might need to let go of. We can also think of our role in helping students to construct um, meaning in a design challenge or a design project with an opportunity to implement a solution based on particular criteria. That example can be a robotic competition that optimizes the performance of a design by prioritizing criteria, making trade-offs, testing, revising, and retesting. You know, as teachers, we want to create these opportunities for students to do that dive on their own, not just to do that linear pathway and we do this, then we do this, we get that outcome and we're done, but we walk through and we question and we bring more information to the table and we digest it and move on. So that's what we challenge you to do with the folks that you are um, connected to on a daily basis. Um, we invite you to continue the conversation in our next um, opportunity through SECO. You put that last slide up. Our next um, presentation is, I think it's in two weeks on a Thursday with SECO. Uh, Christy Dotty is going to be providing examples, again, looking at constructing explanations. It will be a follow-up conversation here. And then next month, we will continue on with our next practice, and I have to cheat, which is engaging in argument from evidence. So we look forward to seeing you uh, next month if not at the next SECO presentation. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. We know it's been a long day. Um, some of you may have had a snow day today, so congratulations if you did. And uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you.